The way the kinetic sequence works is that one segment of the chain maximizes its acceleration and overall force production and then decelerates and allows for the next segment of the chain to maximize its acceleration window before it decelerates and so on. So each segment of the chain works pushing the next segment and adding up force and then allows for that next segment to maximize its force production and so on until the very end of the kinetic sequence where the hands produce force through the ball or through the implement that we're using in our sport. So now what I want to start with is how ground force occurs, the very start of the swinging action and how it can impact all of the force development throughout the entirety of the swing. One thing we have to remember is that when we swing and, and when we produce power when swinging, it's a result of both force and velocity. And if you think about how much force can be developed in a swing, you're probably looking at the lower body as the main determining factor for overall force production in the swing. The reason why is because at the beginning of the kinetic sequence, the muscular actions are going to have to be more forceful to get the body going from a dead stop. Once momentum begins developing up the kinetic chain, then we can start to see more and more velocity production. And by the time the kinetic sequence reaches the upper extremities, we're not looking at a ton of overall force development from these muscle groups. We're looking at very high velocity contractions. Now, per the force-velocity relationship, what we see with muscle groups that have to interact with each other and contract is that when those muscle groups are firing faster, they are not able to produce as much force overall. But because all of the force developed throughout the kinetic chain has happened previously to the upper extremities, we will find that we can create a ton of force when swinging and throwing. And it all starts with the lower extremities producing force into the ground and then transferring it up the kinetic chain. So, the first thing that we have to be able to master is the load. Loading the hips allows for a ton of force development to occur. Similar to when we bend down to jump or, or, or run a sprint, hip extension matters a lot and that all starts with the ability to first hinge or create hip flexion going backwards. So here with the loading action, the rear hip hinges, muscle groups will fire eccentrically or sort of lengthen a little bit to create this stored energy effect. A great way to train this obviously is with hip mobility drills, but to train the strength aspect of this action, you're going to probably want to train with a lot of RDLs, deadlifts, jumps, kettlebell swings, and of course you're going to want to make sure that your hamstrings and your hip flexors are pretty mobile to get the job done. If you can't hinge properly, you're probably not going to produce a whole lot of force in your swing because it's starting in a poor position. If you can hinge well, then you are set up for success down the, the rest of the kinetic sequence. Then, then we have the corkscrewing action where the rear hip begins turning inwards and when that happens, the rotational aspect of the swing really begins to start. And, and this is super important because a lot of people will want to just simply push off of that back leg, not creating a whole lot of rotation. And when this occurs, you're losing out on that sort of transitive property of creating a rotational sequence. You're creating more of a pushing action and you're not going to get nearly as much out of the actual swing as you possibly can. The pelvis begins rotating here very quickly and then the front leg begins producing opposite force of the back leg to start to resist against that uh, sort of excessive rotation and this is where that idea of the front leg brace begins to happen. If the front leg is not producing opposite force then you're going to begin seeing a lot of sliding forward where the athlete cannot effectively transfer energy up the kinetic chain. So then of course obviously the last segment of this is hip overall transfer of energy into the upper extremities and obviously the front leg has completely straightened out representing all of the force that has been developed into the ground and then transferred straight up the kinetic chain. What we see here is that force begins to be delivered and, and transferred almost directly up the kinetic chain here. Whereas before it was creating more of that corkscrewing action where it was resisting and pushing in the opposite direction of the back leg. Now moving on from that we see that 
uh, movements like deadlift and lunge variations do a great job of training the lead leg. What you really have to understand here is that we want to transfer as much energy up the kinetic chain as possible and that only occurs when the lead leg is relatively stiff. That means that the muscle groups have a large content of titan, T-I-T-I-N, which is a large protein molecule that resists against excessive lengthening of the muscles. And what's going to happen there is more energy can be stored in that eccentric portion and then transferred up the chain uh, versus someone who has rather weak legs, very, um, you know, legs that aren't very stiff, they're going to uh, struggle to rapidly transfer force up the kinetic chain there. Um, I really like movements that are rapid plyometrics where the athlete has to react, hit the ground, and jump as high as possible or as far as possible. Unilateral bounding exercises are great. Depth jumps are great. I like to test depth jump RSI to show that this is improving. But you obviously have to look at the athlete. If they are someone who is more uh, force deficient, rather weak in the lower extremities, very um, you know, not a lot of training under their belt, then you are probably going to have to go with a lot more of those heavy lunge variations and split squats to get the most out of that front leg brace.